それでは基調講演とを賜ります先生を紹介いたします国際会議国際科学会議会長ゴードン・マクビーン先生ですマクビーン先生は世界気候研究改革や非政府間国際組織である START 災害リスク統合研究計画に関連する委員会などで議長を務められましたまたカナダ環境省の副次官補を務められ気候や気象大気等の問題について政府に助言を行ってこられました現在はウェスタン・オンタリオ大学において教授として国際会議の会長を兼務されております本日ご講演いただくテーマは、Integrated Research to Reduce Risk and Sustain Development です。それでは、マクビーン先生、よろしくお願いいたします。Well, thank you very much. I'm very pleased and honored to be speaking at this event. I thank all the organizers for bringing this together, Professor i m a r u r o and the New International Research Institute for Disaster Science. So thank you.、Um, What we are seeing around the world is very clear from. Oops. No.、Um, that the number of disasters that we see every year are going up、uh, geophysical, meteorological, hydrological,、um, and these are increasing in numbers.、Uh, the. Okay.、Um, but what. We really see is that the costs and how you define costs is a bit problematic, but and the number of victims are different for different types of hazards and when and where they occur.、Um, as we see with these k i n d of events,、uh, just really focusing on the averages from 2003 to 2012, the number of events of Of hydrological are the, the greatest in numbers, the meteorological, the climatological, the number of geophysical events. But when you look into the details of this, the effects on people, the effects on、uh, the, num- the costs and how you define costs, as I said, is a bit problematic. These vary very much between these k i n d of events.、Um, for example, if we go to the impacts, we can see in terms of on the right hand column. The,、uh, the per event average costs in US billions of dollars. And the geophysical events are the ones that really actually cause also the greatest number of fatalities per event.、Um, we've seen, for example, also the costs, as,、uh, uh, as has been tragically seen in this area, the costs of these earthquakes and geophysical events are, are very large.、Um, Margarita Wallstrom,、uh, some years ago now, stated that the, over the last two decades,、uh, 76% of all disaster events were hydrological, meteorological, or climatological in nature, but they counted for 45% of the deaths, 79% of the economic costs. But a more important thing is the real tragedy is that many of these deaths can be, and I would say should be, avoided. And that needs to be our emphasis. Uh, as you know better than I, the Great d e t h Earthquake happened, well, four years ago tomorrow.、Uh, there w a s a very large number of fatalities, disproportionately very large in the older people, 65 and older, and I'm now one of those.、Uh, the estimated damage costs in the hundreds of billions of dollars, and still recovery costs that are continuing to today.、Um, So, I guess what I'm saying is that the outcome of the conference we are about to see starting、uh, this weekend, the Third World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction, should be so that we see that in the end, by remembering, for example, the future, remembering for the future, that the many of these deaths and damages should be avoided. So, what actions do we need to take? I'm not going to be able to. Clarify them all for you in my presentation, but I want to talk about some of the science aspects for disaster risk reduction. One of the first things we know is that the impacts of a hazard depend upon, obviously, the hazard itself, the nature and severity of the event. It also depends on the vulnerability, the predisposition of a person or group to be adversely affected, and their exposure. Who are the exposed people, properties, 
and how vulnerable are they in that context. So disaster risk itself relates to the likelihood of severe alterations in the normal functioning of a community or society due to these hazard events interacting with vulnerable social conditions. And part of our emphasis has to be to work on so reducing exposure and in reducing the vulnerability, increasing the resilience of people in these exposed areas. So as I said, exposure, vulnerability are key determinants of disaster risk. And we also need to remember that it's, it's, the tragedy is also that it's not only the average people, but in many cases the poorest people or the elderly people who are most impacted. And we have this, what we call the disaster risk poverty nexus from an earlier report from UN International Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction. I'm not sure whether Reed actually wrote this one or not, but he, he might have been involved in it. And I think it's important to look at the various global factors, the underlying factors, and then as these things come together with the everyday risks of poverty, poor people, and everyday risk, and as we then have these impacts go across, the net result is a sort of secular effect is that the impact on the poorer people is that you have even more poverty outcomes, more exposed people, more vulnerable people again. And we have to try and stop this cycle, this nexus of poverty disaster continuing. So I guess I want to emphasize that although we are talking about disaster risk reduction, this is a year, 2015, when through the UN family of agencies, we are dealing with disaster risk, we're dealing with, oops, with climate change and sustainable development. These are linked issues. They're not separate. They need to be brought together in an integrated way based on what I would argue science-based information. Let's find strategies that, that are addressing these issues in a way that is integrated is scientifically based and will result in net positive benefits. So I'd like now just very briefly to talk about the International Council for Science that I hope you've heard about, but if you haven't, here's what it is. The International Council for Science was originated back in 1931 and it is a non-governmental organization with a global membership of approximately 120 academies of science, national foundations around the world. The Japan Science Council is the member from Japan. It varies in countries, but collectively it represents most of the world's population, 140 countries or so. And we also have what we call international scientific unions, so math, physics, chemistry, biology, but also psychology, sociology, history of science, and these kind of things brought together in terms of groups. The geological sciences, earthquake people, the geology, geophysics people, meteorology storms are all parts of the International Council for Science. It's an organization which is mission is to strengthen international science for the benefit of society and I emphasize that it's for all societies. We need to work as a scientific community to build that expertise and provide benefits to all societies. Our mission, or sorry, our vision is that in the long-term strategic vision will be one where the world's community, science is used for the benefit of all. Excellence is science is valued. Scientific knowledge is effectively linked to policy making. And unfortunately, this is not always the case now. We, so we need to work together as communities of scientists to make this the case. Our key priorities are three. They're based on the issues of science for policy, the universality of science. So scientists everywhere have the opportunity to work together through across international boundaries. They're not restricted by national politics or international politics. And very much research collaboration on an international basis. And we've been doing this for some years. And I'll just talk about more recently some of the programs to put this in context as to how we get to where we are now. Back in 1980, there was the World Climate Research Program, uh, which was brought together by these organizations on the climate change issue. 1986, we started a new program on global change. And the sense of the science then was that we need to have some way of assessing it. And in 1988, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was organized 
brought together as an agency to do the assessment of the science for the basis of policymakers. And I guess I just raised this question in the disaster risk reduction field. We don't have that equivalence, so maybe we should. Um, we had resulting in part, but not entirely, but in part the, as of the result of the IPCC reports was in 1992 at the UN meetings that was created the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. We've also had programs on biodiversity and things which I'll skip over in view of time. We've created programs on capacity building, such as START International, which works in Asia and Africa to involve young scientists, scientists in developing countries in international research programs. In the 90s, there was the International Decade of Natural Disaster Reduction, 10 years of working together to get things started to understand on, on the science of disaster risk reduction. And in 1994 was the first of what we're now seeing, the third, but the first one, the World Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction held in Yokohama. I had the pleasure of attending that meeting. Uh, it was very interesting to me to get involved in that. By that time, I was a government of Canada senior bureaucrat um, and created human programs. So partially as a result of the international decade of natural disaster reduction, but the increasing number of disasters around the world, the UN created the International Strategy for Disaster Reduction with its global assessment reports starting in 2000 and so on. And in 2005, we had the second World Conference on Disaster Reduction in Kobe. And I guess what I want to emphasize is that out of that came a very important document, the Kyogo Framework for Action on, on Disaster Risk Reduction, which talked about the importance of the knowledge of hazards and the physical, social, economic, environmental vulnerabilities. These we need to bring together, physical, social, economic, environmental, engineering, medicine, etc. those issues together in ways that we need to see how we can have that these hazards that are changing in the short and long term are changed in a way that we have fewer uh, disasters in the future. The four, sorry, five act priorities for action included, for example, uh, making disaster risk reduction a national and local priority. The issues of early warning systems, monitoring, knowledge, innovation, education, cultures of safety and resilience, reduce the underlying risk factors, get to those questions of vulnerability and exposure, and strengthen disaster preparedness so that when they do happen, the hazards happen, there can be more effective response. These are the things we need to work together. The International Council for Science took these rather seriously. We, right after the Kobe meeting in 2005, we created a scoping group uh, and a, out of that came a science plan for a new research program called Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, where we really wanted to take an integrated approach across international, multidisciplinary, natural health, engineering, social sciences, etc., a collaborative program that would be at least decades in length. This program, Integrated Research on Disaster Risk, now exists, sponsored by the Council of Science, the International Social Science Council, and the United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Risk Reduction. So we're working together. Uh, this program took a lot of thinking, and there are people in this room, I'm sure, besides myself and Reed and others who were, and oh, bad we, who were part of the thinking process. What should we focus on? What should be the objectives? We tried to very much think about the point of view of focusing on prevention, knowing the hazards will happen, how do we prevent it so they don't become disasters. And we wanted the multidisciplinary approach. So we talked about the characterization of hazards, vulnerability, and risk, working them across them, social sciences, economic, engineering, etc. Equally important, though, is effective decision-making in complex and changing risk contexts. How do people make a decision when they hear the warning, there is a tsunami approaching? What actions do they take? How are they informed? What do they do? In my country, near where I live, tornadoes. When they hear a tornado warning, what should they do? Not run to the window and get a good picture of it coming, as some Canadians seem to think that's what you're supposed to do. They should 
have a plan and strategy. And this is part of this decision-making process for individuals and also for governments at all levels. And how do we work together so we can actually find some knowledge-based actions to reduce risk and curb losses? We put together projects such as forensic investigations, looking in real depth what went wrong and why, what are the data, capacity building, and ass assessments. So these projects are now existing and underway, and we're working together with colleagues in Japan and around the world to put together the science program that is now in place. So continuing back to this complicated diagram I showed you a minute ago, we've now put in place, as I said, this new program on disaster risk. So we've got climate change, bio biodiversity, human sides, now disaster risk. We brought in a program on the world data system. The issues of data and information are very important. I'm very pleased to say that as of about a year ago, the Secretariat for the World Data System is located in Tokyo with the support of the Japanese government. Uh, more recently, the issue of health, which we've not really covered as well as we should have, has now become a focus of a new program on urban health and well-being where we look at the issues of how do people's health be affected by all of this as they're hit with disasters. And I guess part of the trouble is this diagram has become so complex that we need to understand it better. And part of the logic is taking that circle and bringing it all together in a new program we're calling Future Earth, Research for Global Sustainability. What is our future? What is our Earth going to be like? And how can we change it in a way that we actually have sustainability? And this has brought together all of these agencies, the Council of Science, but also World Meteorological Organization, United Nations Environment Program, UNESCO, United Nations University, and importantly, these two groups, Belmont and IGFA, they are the funding agencies of the world. All the research councils working together around the world to say, yes, we'll put our money in to support science in these areas. And so we're working together to make this happen. It is now, uh, really underway, and what we're trying to do is focus on what I'll call three themes of action, dealing with our dynamic planet, with its states and trends, where are the critical zones, coastal zones, for example, what are the global development issues, equitable access, stewardship of resources, and how do we actually transform towards sustainability with innovation and ideas, regional and global governance issues, and transformation processes. This program will deal with issues of social equity, poverty reduction, human rights, et cetera, down that list, including things like data and information, international law, so on. And the program, as I said, is now largely set up. We're just about to start to make it happen. But one of the key parts in trying to make it happen is something we're doing differently. We've not asked 100 leading scientists to go off in a corner and design the program. Instead, we're doing what we call a co-design to involve the stakeholder community, people from the public sector, from the private sectors, from medical communities, all kinds of governments issues to work together with the science community to design what the science objective should be. What kind of programs do we need to carry out? And not just leave it as designing it, but working together to co-produce and co-deliver the results to people, organizations, and governments around the world. So this will be a continual academic and stakeholder involvement through the course of this program, and we're going to be looking for opportunities like the STS Forum, the International Research Institute in Disaster Science here. How can these organizations play a role in helping to design, produce, and deliver, in the end, this kind of research? So this is something that will be a challenge to us, but we think it's very important that it be done. So this is what we're doing to try and really develop the science for policy niche that needs to be carried out. So out of all of this, forgetting all of the details in there, the idea is to pull all of this together through co-design, co-production, co-delivery, so that we can feed out of all of this science into defining whatever we call it, the post-215 Hyogo framework for action number two or whatever, but also to feed into the development of the UN sustainability, Sustainable Development Goals, 
Let's have these consistent with one another and the climate convention of things. What the result is that this was brought together by science, science informing and working with policymakers to deliver this kind of result. So we've, as a, to get part of this process underway, and I'm not going to go into this in view of the time, this clock thing seems to have stopped, so I don't know where I am in my time, but anyway, um, is the idea that we've actually had an ad hoc group of leading scientists put together a, an interim, what we call a disaster risk, uh, risk re research and assessment to promote risk reduction and management. This is a, an ad hoc group that we've been putting in the, this document is all but finished to have, how do we put the science in, in a formatted place? This is a one-time thing we need to see out of, out of this meeting here in Sendai. How do we see what we need in the future? Uh, so some of the things that we're needing to talk about, as I keep saying, disaster risk reduction, sustainable development, science as a basin for action, feeding through to national policies, we need to network these programs, integrated research on disaster risk, future earth, urban health, and all the other acronyms, and have a science-driven approach to disaster risk reduction, made it possible through research, assessment, synthesis, with monitoring and review of the data so we actually know whether we're making progress over the decades, and communicate and engagement so the best practices are implemented, and capacity building needs to be done. So through this partnership of the Council of Science, our programs, the, Span the Science Council of Japan, UNISDR, IRI, DES, et cetera, we're trying to work on these key areas of assessment, synthesis, advice to government. So this works together, and out of this comes decisions, monitoring and review, communication and engagement, and capacity building. These work together to create what I'll call the future we want. This is the statement out of the 2012 Rio meeting, the uh, uh, common vision that we need to work together, a broad alliance of people, government, civil society, and private sector working to secure the future we want. So let's think about that as we move ahead into the, the week of, that come and as we go looking out as you, the, His Imperial Highness, the Crown Prince, spoke at a meeting I was at a little while ago, not one generation, but several generations ahead needs to be our focus. So with that, I'd like to end with, by saying that we need to address these issues for intergenerational and international equity. Those are my grandchildren, plus my daughter and her husband, sitting on Einstein's statue in the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, some other grandchildren of other people around the world. And that's what we're working for. Let's work for our children and grandchildren to make it happen so that we have evidence-based policies for disaster risk reduction and sustainable development. And so I'd just say in concluding, I thank you very much for the Institute here for organizing this meeting, having this symposium, and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much.